Sasha said. I'm Martin Murray. I'm with the Literary Committee of the Arts Club of Washington. And this is one of a series of Arts Club at Home Zoom webinars that we've been doing during um, the unfortunate pandemic that we are all experiencing. But tonight we're going to experience an evening of deep beauty, the name of the collection of essays by 40 wonderful writers across the United States and also I understand in Europe as well, uh, which was edited by uh, Rosemary Winslow and Catherine Lee. We're going to be hearing from about five or six uh, of those essayists tonight. Um, and the point of the, uh, the book was really to, to try to bring a sense of how do we experience wonder in a world on fire. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our two editors who are going to be kind of um, shepherding us through this program, just as they shepherded the SES through this wonderful publication. And actually, let me hold up the book for those of you who are not familiar with it yet. We're hoping that you will, will get a copy. I think it's Woodhull Press. And there is a Deep Beauty website, which uh, hopefully we will be referencing at some point later in the evening. And also, I want to point out that the uh, beautiful cover uh, painting was done by John Winslow, who is the husband of one of the editors, Rosemary Winslow. Rosemary Winslow is somebody that I got to know many years ago. We both have a great uh, fin affinity for the American poet Walt Whitman. Rosemary has taught for many years Walt Whitman uh, at a, a local university. She's a retired professor now. Uh, but she's also a poet, a researcher, and she lives with her husband, John, a visual artist. Rosemary has hosted a number of uh, poetry seminars in her own home, and she's also a published poet, written a number of poetry books. Rosemary grew up on a dairy farm in western New York State where the land, climate, trees, fields, and mammals offered both harshness and beauty. Hiking, swimming, gardening, yoga, and volunteering keep her in close touch with land and community. So Rosemary is gonna introduce each of our speakers, but I also want to take a moment to also introduce and welcome uh, Catherine, also known as Katie Lee. Katie is a freelance writer and editor who previously worked as at the Philadelphia Inquirer as a reporter. And she was also a communications director at the Catholic University of America here in Brooklyn, Mass uh, not Brooklyn, Massachusetts, but Brooklyn, Washington, DC, not too far from uh, me on the subway. Uh, Katie recently had stories published in Catholic University's alumni magazine about nursing and social work graduates serving on the front lines of the pandemic. So with that, let me turn the program over to Rosemary and Kate. Rosemary, you're next up. I, I unmuted, yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank everyone for spending uh, an hour or so here uh, on Zoom. Probably you've been a lot on Zoom uh, and on this beautiful evening too. Uh, thanks to you, Martin, Sasha, the Washington Arts Club for inviting this reading. And thanks to Colin, Chris, and Dave at Woodhall Press for their wonderful work with the book. Um, and especially, most of all, to the rioters for making these beautiful essays. Uh, when Katie and I conceived this book and were editing it, we did not expect the world would be literally on fire. The book's impetus came from political discourse in 2016 and 2017 that was co-opting the word beauty for a cultural perspective promoted by one person and subsequently adopted by some other Americans. The other hook for me was having studied theory after theory in graduate school uh, theories of beauty that were argued and altered by successive generations and how I thought how strange they're all arguing about beauty they're arguing 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 about beauty so this was an opportunity to dig into the subject 
And I'd long thought of beauty as having personal dimensions, such as beauty is in the eye of the beholder, an idea first expressed apparently by Thomas Aquinas that has long since become general in Western culture, and also broad cultural views, which also came through, changed through time. I thought much about inner beauty, none of which seemed to be current in theories of beauty as critics and commentators focused on material aspects and views. So I wondered what other people thought beauty was. Katie came on board as co-editor one May evening three years ago while dining near Catholic University, where we both then worked. We put out a call for essays on how people's experiences of wonder launched them into beauty and how they subsequently reshaped their lives as a result. This collection of essays by 41 writers is the result. The writers hail from across the, the country and uh, from various walks of life, ages, and backgrounds. Katie and I organized the essays into six sections. Uh, uh, the first on the arts, on the body, on the body politic, on challenging or difficult times, on city and country, and on holy spaces. I'd like to read not from my introduction, but from the foreword by Thomas Moore, a Jungian psychologist and spiritual teacher. Dr. Moore has authored 28 books, including his first, The Care of the Soul, a New York Times bestseller, and it was reissued because it was so popular 25 years later. His, he's also a New Hampshire writer, which is where I happen to be at the moment. His books recognize the importance of beauty for creating a full and rich life. All of us involved in the, with the book are most grateful to Dr. Moore for his thoughtful and insightful foreword. Uh, and here's some of what he has to say. Um, the essays in this book themselves beautiful in different ways, but especially in their careful use of words spell out how beauty plays its important role in ordinary life and how varied it can be. All the essays are poignant, largely about relationships and life-changing events. The essays here support these points, I have skipped some, in concrete but highly sensitive terms. It's an extraordinary collection. The writers outdid themselves no doubt inspired and challenged by their assignment to glimpse this most elusive and yet important quality in their life experiences. And I have to say that some writers and one who is an ex, ex university longtime expert in essay study and writing said this is the most difficult essay she's ever written and others wrote the same thing. It's a difficult topic for, for to, to get a hold of and em emotionally deep as well. The writers make it clear that this topic is the most important of our time, especially in America when ugliness is entering public life more brazenly than in the memory of most of us. Political discourse is rarely inspirational, but it has sunk to lows that up to now have been unimaginable. The writers refer to this development and make a significant contribution in alerting us to a special need for the beautiful at this time in history. Dark times breed fresh vitality. I try to keep in mind that the astonishing beauty of Renaissance thought and art arose in a time of constant warfare and sadistic rulers. Read the lofty and highly original ideas of Ralph Waldo Emerson and remember that the bloody civil war was raging in his time and that slaves were being hidden in private homes in his hometown. All our problems ultimately derive from a loss of soul and a good way to restore soul is to recover a sense of the beautiful. A beautiful thing, however small, has the power to restore the soul to society. This book on beauty could reorient us in a time when essential values have been lost. These writers have put their hearts and minds fully into their stories and show us a way toward renewal. That's Thomas More. And Katie Lee is going to read next, and she is reading, Katie has already been introduced. Um, She's reading from her essay, 
uh, Last Months of a Life. And she writes, as Thomas More says, about the ordinary and small um, and how to make beauty of that. Uh, Katie? Katie? Okay. All right. There we go. Thanks, Rosemary. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, as Rosemary I said, I'm going to read from an essay about my sister-in-law, um, who uh, was diagnosed with cancer in September and passed away five months later. Uh, so let me begin. I'm startled when I see Kat's name appear on my phone. It's 6.30 on a weekday morning in September. She rarely calls that early. Sounding scared, she says her stomach hurts. She's going to the ER. A test reveals that she has fluid in her belly. More tests follow, and a month later, she has the diagnosis, which drops like a bomb into our lives, at first traveling silently without warning, and then landing with a sickening crash, stage four breast cancer that has spread to her bones and abdomen. I'm reminded of the sounds that my brothers used to make when they played as children with small plastic soldiers. Kaboosh! like thunder crashing over the beach, the air charged with lightning off in the distance, crackling, deafening, the sky suddenly turning from dark to light and then dark again. With the diagnosis, life lurches into a frightening, unfamiliar place where conversations are filled with forbidding medical terms like paracentesis, tumor markers, hormone receptors, and triple negative breast cancer. Life seems frantic and out of control. I stumble over the names of cast medications, Dilaudid, Zofran, Decadron, trying to commit them to memory. She starts chemo, a friend who's a lawyer prepares her will. Kath asks me and my husband, her only sibling, to meet her at the hospital for the talk with the doctors. The room where we gather is barely large enough to hold all of us. Okay, she says, let's cut to the chase. The doctors are kind and sensitive, but honest. With more chemo, she has a few months at best. Without it, probably just a few more weeks. A sad silence seeps into the room. Ever a pragmatist, Kath has already decided that if the doctor's news is bad, she'll move to the hospice near the hospital where she's been getting her chemo. By then, it's December just 10 days before Christmas, and cold outside. A nurse covers Kath with soft white cotton blankets. Aides gently lift her onto a stretcher for the short ambulance ride to the hospice. My husband and I follow in our car, bringing a few things that she has with her, a change of clothes, her knitting, a magazine, and a book. When she's admitted to the hospice, medical colleagues who know her think there's been a mistake because she occasionally refers patients there, but it's not a mistake. Just another cruel swipe at a woman who now finds herself a patient, cared for, cared for by others in a room with a small bath at the end of a hallway. After Kath moves, I take leave from my job so I can drive from my home in Washington, D.C. to the hospice in Towson, Maryland to help care for her daily. The frenzied pace and uncertainty about her remaining time gives way to an, to an unexpected calmness. My days unfold at a far different pace than before, more slowly and deliberately than when I was working in a busy communications office at a DC university. My sister-in-law's good friend Mary is also a daily visitor to the hospice, where we fill Cass' room with fresh bouquets of Alstra Maria and Hydrangea from Eddie's Market on Charles Street and spend our time reading the Baltimore Sun and New York Times, talking about the news and watching hour and hour of cooking and home renovation shows. On the drive home, I think about the time spent at the hospice. Some days her room is quiet. On other occasions, visitors fill the room, bringing with them carbs, cookies, wool socks, and lively conversation. How can these days be so ordinary, but at the same time, so rich and full of life, so beautiful? 
Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next we'll hear from Baron Wormser, uh, whom I've known since, I guess, 1902. I've read so much of his, his 18 books. And uh, Baron has published 18 books, uh, poetry, memoir, lyric essay, fictional essay, uh, and memoir. He has been awarded fellowships. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I heard some background. Uh, Baron has been awarded fellowship National Endowment for the Arts and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. His most recent book is a novel, Songs from a Life. It explores American culture and music in recent decades through a fictional lens akin to Bob Dylan's life. Baron is reading from his essay, Off the Grid. Baron? Thank you, Rosemary. This essay stems from the uh, over two decades that uh, my family and I lived uh, without any power, electricity in the Maine woods. As decision makers who forewent the advantages of electricity, we were impractical. Among other tasks, we had to do our laundry in a laundromat each week. The money we spent on gasoline to drive to a nearby town and the quarters the machine swallowed did not add up to the cost of those electricity poles, though there were times we fantasized about walking a few steps to a washer dryer. Our heads, however, tended to be elsewhere than convenience. We sought to appreciate the power that came without the poles and lines and that emanated from the earth, the trees, the sky all the feeling that belonged to that particular spot. We felt, though we didn't often use the word, that some magic was in that spot, that there was a natural opening there for people to live. People had done it before, that was encouraging. We were linked to long gone strangers, anonymous forebears. The sum of such considerations that over the years, much manual labor was a feeling for beauty, as something not at an aesthetic remove, a matter of museums or of popular culture, a matter of film stars and models, but as a practice and economy. By that, I mean that we dwelt foremost with the straightforward beauty of the natural world, dangling catkins and rumbustious frogs. We didn't want anything to get between us and the beauty that spoke for the voluminous energy of the earth. So much there. Our house had few closets because we had few possessions. Instead, we had the plentitude of being. What, was, what we wanted was for the spirit of the outdoors to permeate the indoors. There was no need to describe the beauty because there was no describing it. The beauty was the totality of the environment that we felt each day. Right from the start of our life in the woods, that beauty compelled us. We learned to live without electricity. We learned to live with the spider webs and snow drifts and wind in the pines. We learned to create our own beauty in the flower gardens we made around the house. Flowers came to be our main contribution to the beauty of the location, and flowers became something like a totem to us. We knew our botany well enough, but the point of the flowers was the delight in their colors, fragrances, and forms. They exemplified beauty. We weren't happening on anything new there. A world without flowers would be an impossible world. What we didn't know before we moved to the woods is how beauty belongs to us and how beauty belongs in the life of the earth. Previously, we might go somewhere and ooh and ah over the picturesqueness of some vista, but in the woods, we weren't going anywhere. We lived there. We were dwellers. All this was hard to explain. Beauty was not a word that came up in many conversations. Beauty was something off to the side or not even on the table. Beauty was rare. 
What we began to feel over the years of our sojourn in the woods was that beauty was unexceptional. That was part of beauty's charm. The beauty of any passing natural moment didn't require commentary. After all, it was passing. Another moment was there and then that was gone. Beauty was indebted to transience and was weightless. Thank you. Oh, next, we're thank you, Baron. And next we're going to hear from Kathy Wolf, who is a poet. Her most recent collection is Love and Kumquats, New and Selected Poems from Brick House Books. She is also a journalist. She is a contributor with the LGBTQ paper in Washington, to, uh, known as the Washington Blade. Kathy is reading from her essay, A Blindista's Notes on Beauty, Unseeing Stairs, Velvet Ears, Espresso Fingertips. Kathy, welcome. Okay, thank you very much for having me read. A shout out to Rosemary and Katie and to the Arts Club. A Blindista's Notes on Beauty. I'm a Blindista. In the cafe, my fingertips awake to the aroma of espresso. My case buds dance with it. I'm enveloped by the verdant softness of my cashmere sweater. My girlfriend hands me a packet of sugar then strokes my hair. Her hair smells of strawberries. Holding hands, we, we swoon to the sound of stirring spoons. Only my white cane lands in the fog of your radar screen. I'm seven years old and playing with the other kids. Blind girls have cooties, Frankie says. If I kissed you, I'd turn into a frog. I'm in the seventh grade. I know my grandma loves me, but we have different visions of my future. No one will marry you, she says, but you can be another Helen Keller. It's the 1990s, and I've been asked to write about an exhibit on Helen Keller. I'm not excited by this. Surprisingly, my ears prick up and the hairs on the back of my neck stand up as I begin to learn about Keller. I soon begin to feel so close to her that I start to think of her as Helen. Keller, I discover, was not only a socialist and a woman suffragette, but a striking, earthy beauty. Mark Twain taught her to spit tobacco. My mind's ear savors the sound of the snuff hitting the sidewalk. The taste of smoked sausage and the warmth of the sun on your skin was as beautiful to her as it is to me. In 1916, when she was 36, Keller and journalist Peter Fagan fell in love. They planned to marry, but her family forbid them to wed. Keller wasn't stymied by this. No effort that we make to attain something beautiful is ever lost, she wrote. It's Eden. I'm walking along Main Street in a sleepy Midwestern town with a woman who's blind. We're studying feminist spirituality. We've spent more time eating ice cream and flirting than on our studies. But who cares? She takes my face in her hands and kisses me. If only Frankie could see us. One spring, one spring day, I'm having lunch with my late partner, who was fully sighted at our favorite Chinese place. Full of love and kumquats, we get up to leave. A prune-faced woman says to Anne about me, as if Anne were my nurse, not my girlfriend. You should watch her. She might fall. I do, and I enjoy it, she whispers. I bet I won't ever discuss I bet I won't ever discover fully what beauty is, but I wouldn't want to stop trying. Maybe it's the sound of chicken frying, the bang of a door slamming, the smell of pomegranate shampoo. I only know the adventure is in the searching. And as Helen Keller said, life without adventure would be nothing at all. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we're going to hear next from Gail George. Gail is a creative economist and content curator who helps people prosper from their uniqueness. As creative director of Gail Force Publishing, she, she gives space to authoritative voices on wealth, women, and wisdom, and wisdom of the di diaspora. She founded Weems the People Foundation to preserve the living legacy of her third great grandparents, John and Arabella Weems, and the rich story of their compelling escape from captivity along the Underground Railroad. For more information, visit www.gailgeorge.com. Uh, I believe she's do, uh, working on a film with grant money about this topic. Gail's essay is titled Mastering the Pieces. Thank, Thank you, Rosemary, Katie, and uh, to the Arts Club of Washington for this opportunity to share and to read this evening. Whoever came up with the idea to describe the dissolution of a marriage as breaking up was on to something. I will never forget the look of horror that came over my son's sweet face as he stretched the limits of his seven-year-old imagination to make sense of what was becoming of his family. Unlike the cinnamon graham crackers he so enjoyed breaking along their perforated lines, we would not actually be breaking into pieces. It was just certain aspects of our family dynamic that would be changing, I explained. Ultimately, they would affect the way he was schooled, where we lived, and the structure of his childhood, as well as his perception of family, relationships, and ability to navigate the wider world. In retrospect, his perception about our family's breakup was probably closer to right than I ever wanted to believe. Ours would not be a clean break. The family we created had become for me like a beautiful handcrafted pottery through which the practical application of my highest ideals and determination to leave my indelible mark on the world would be expressed. It also held the deceit, immaturity, and generational patterns of dysfunction that would ultimately shatter its evolving. That's where wabi-sabi came in. It's a Zen philosophy drawn from the Japanese art form called kintsugi, or golden repair. Wabi-sabi is created when bo broken pottery is mended with a lacquer of gold, silver, or platinum. Instead of restoring the ceramic to good as new condition, this type of repair accentuates the break in the finished design, immortalizing the previous brokenness into a masterpiece that restores the shape of the original vessel while preserving the authenticity of its resilience, the story of its recreation. As a lifestyle, Wabi Sabi eliminates regret alleviates doubt, and integrates infinite possibility in proportion to one's ability to acknowledge the beauty inherent in imperfection. What may be regarded as failure in the West simply becomes a distinction that holds even greater value when adorned and celebrated. This perspective gave me the courage to show up to my own brokenness. And slowly, my life began to reflect the beauty of these golden repairs, each one adding a measure of previously inconceivable value and strength. The new receptacle born of this transformational mending rendered me able to receive in a different way. It engendered a profound sense of tolerance and appreciation for the range of experiences that make up my life and the lives of those around me. My life is an authentic design drawn from my own personal experiences, my unique story, my distinct journey of a thousand miles. Each departure from what I imagined and intended adds dimension to the unfolding and further expands my concept of what is ideal. There is no inherently right or wrong path. There is only what we have now and what we determine to make of it, ever. Recognizing beauty in the brokenness 
is a discipline with rich rewards for every hard won realization that can be assimilated. Broken pieces brought together in celebration can create a lasting peace. This quest has become my refuge, my religion, my daily practice, and the definition of deep beauty to me. Thank you, Gail. That was beautiful. Uh, and next we're going to hear from uh, Deborah Ziska. Deborah wrote the essay, American Protest, that's in the book, and she spent 40 plus years in communications, uh, 27 of them at the National Gallery of Art. Now she is writing, consulting, producing films, and teaching in the Museum Studies graduate program at Johns Hopkins University. Her most recent protest was the candlelight vigil for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Until she can travel the world again, she is taking a video editing course and finishing up a paper on lessons museums can learn from indigenous and Afro-descendant communities in the Americas. Deborah's essay is American Protests. Deborah? Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, everyone. A friend of mine who describes herself as quote unquote, a career military veteran with a worldview of life, accompanied me to the March for Our Lives on March 24th, 2018, organized by the student survivors from Parkland. It was her first march in Washington. She said she was both nervous and excited. When I asked her later about her lasting impressions of the experience, she wrote, as a military veteran, we are trained to be aware and cautious about our surroundings. This march showed me that when we, the people, believe intimately about something, we can come together as one mass of humanity, peacefully and passionately. The beautiful sounds of all of our voices and chants and song gave me chill bumps gave me hope for our future, and actually made me consider running for political office again. God only knows. One of the most beautiful soul-searching moments of all the protests and marches I've ever participated in over the years happened at that march and brought me full circle from my Kent State-inspired walkout during my senior year in high school on yet another sunny day in spring. Emma Gonzalez, also a graduating senior, but from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, stood on stage at the foot of the U.S. Capitol, recalling the mass shooting and reciting the names of the dead who would never again enjoy the beautiful experiences of everyday life. Then she became silent leading some 200,000 people lining Pennsylvania Avenue into minutes of silence peppered by chants of never again. Together, we relived the short period of time it took for a young man with a semi-automatic rifle to kill 14 students and three adults and wound 17 more. Before walking off the stage, Gonzalez delivered prose worthy of a Pulitzer. Since the time that I came out here, it has been six minutes and 20 seconds. The shooter has ceased shooting and will soon abandon his rifle, blend in with the students as they escape, and walk free for an hour before his arrest. Fight for your lives before it's someone else's job. I will, Emma. And so I'll just, I was going to do two selections, but since there's not much time, I'll let others take the space. Thank you so much, Deborah. You're welcome. My across the street neighbor, and we've been watching <laughs> the protests in D.C. and uh, closely lately. It's too bad you can't write an addendum. <laughs> but maybe on the website, yeah. Um, we're going to hear next from Moira Egan, who currently lives in Rome. 
though she's from the Baltimore area and has either lived in DC, I'm not sure, but taught. She has a lot of student, poetry students here in DC, I know. Moira's most recent books are Synesthesium, which won the new Criterion Poetry Prize in 2017, and All Factorium, uh, published by Italic Pequod in 2018. Her poems and prose have appeared in journals and anthologies on four continents. With her husband, Damiano Abeni, she has published volumes in translation in Italy by authors including uh, Ashbery, Barth, Bender, Ferlinghetti, Hecht, Simic, Strand, and Charles Wright. And I believe she's won, they've won the Rome Prize for Ashbery or one of the books, if I'm not mistaken. She lives in Rome and teaches creative writing at St. Stephen's School. Moira is reading from her essay, Any Given Sunday in Rome. Moira. Thank you, Rosemary. And thank you, editors, Rosemary and Katie, for having included me in this beautiful thing. And I'm so delighted to see some very dear people here on this call. I'm going to start, we're having lunch and then we're going for a walk. We eat, we drink, we chat. The people who work here are our extended family. Andrea, Simone, Edo, Luca, Kevin, Paola, Barbara, Stefania, Valentina. They know they can tempt us with just one portion of dessert, which we will share, per condividere. The menu has changed, and the season is right for an orange sorbetto doused with Campari. They already know the joke with me. I prefer anything bitter, but especially my dessert. It's the color of sunset, deep orange with streaks of red, bitter and sweet, cold and bracing, which is exactly what we need to fortify ourselves to go back out into the nascent summer sun and make our way home. But Damiano has an idea. Let's go visit our favorite saint, he says. It's been a while. So we overshoot the mark of the Colosseum and our home and head toward Termini, I don't think you could plan an uglier in situ situation for such a beautiful little church. Stuck beside the Termini train station between its, what is it, a smokestack, a defunct spiraling water tower, and the traffic tunnel that takes you into San Lorenzo, the district that was bombed during World War II, you will find a perfectly proportioned tiny gem of a church. Dedicated to Santa Bibiana, its Baroque facade was Gian Lorenzo Bernini's first ar architectural commission in Rome. Just looking at the facade will fulfill your sublimity quotient for the day. But inside, in the altar niche, is a statue of the saint herself, also the work of a young Bernini. Recently, during a wonderful Bernini retrospective at the Galleria Borghese, I was able to see this statue in the round, I walked up to it, and even before I consciously realized who and what it was, I let out a squeal of delight. I scared the other museum visitors, and I think embarrassed my dear friend Jeannie, my museum-going date that day. To see Santa Bibiana outside of her niche, the voluptuous folds of her gown, her beautiful yet pious face, the traditional attributes of martyrdom are present. In her left hand, she holds the sheaf of palm leaves. Beside her, to her right, there's the column, the reference to her death by scourging. But her right hand is held up in a gesture that would not be out of place as the mudra of a Hindu goddess summoning her followers to reverence. This right hand was one of the first and mo most artfully artfully executed examples of a hand with freestanding fingers, none of those interdigital marble supports that look like something gooey got stuck in there and then hardened, freestanding, gently gesturing fingers. But somehow, as they were putting her back into her niche after the exhibition, someone managed to break off her right ring finger. When I read this news, I was distraught. I was incensed. How could they not have protected this hand properly, this freestanding miracle of a hand in marble, this beautiful carved hand by Bernini? The controversy went on for days. Finally, they found the finger and put it back on. They say you can't see the damage, 
but I've seen the before and the after of Michelangelo's Pietà, and the Madonna's nose has never been the same. We haven't yet gone back to check on the saint's fixed finger. I'll get there, maybe next Sunday, when I can awaken in a leisurely fashion, enjoy the silence for an hour or so, go downstairs for milk for my coffee. After Pashlo's daughter paints my hand with a beautiful Mendy design, maybe then I'll go and see how the hand of my beloved Santa Bibiana has fared. I hope that it is still beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, thank Martha. You. And, and thank you for getting up in the middle of the night in Rome to be on this call and read. I hope you'll be able to go back to sleep. Um, next, uh, we're going to hear from Hayes and Terry uh, Davis. I, I guess Terry had a meeting and couldn't be with us, but they co-wrote the essay, and Hayes is here to read. Uh, I'll read bios for both. Hayes Davis' first collection, Let Our Eyes Linger, was published by Poetry Mutual Press. His work has appeared in the journals New England Review, Poet Lore, and others, as well as several anthologies. Note for a push for, uh, he was uh, nominated for a Pushcart Prize in 2016 and 2017. He is a member of Kaveh Kahnem's first cohort of fellows and a former bread loaf working scholar. He teaches high school English in Washington, D.C., and lives in Maryland with his wife, poet Terry Ellen Cross Davis and their children. Terry Ellen Cross Davis is the author of A More Perfect Union, winner of the 2019 journal slash uh, Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize and Haint, winner of the 2017 Ohio Anna Book Award for Poetry. She is the Poetry Society of America's 2020 Robert H. Winner Memorial Award winner and the, the recipient of grants from the Sustainable Arts mm, sorry, Foundation and the Freya Project. She coordinates the Obi Hardison Poetry Series at the Folger Shakespeare Library. Terry and Hayes' essay is titled Pedestal, A Reflection of Blackness and Beauty in Two Voices. Is Hayes Thanks. here? Yes, I am. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Um, it's really an honor to be a part of this collection. Um, thank you to Rosemary and Catherine for, for putting it together. Thank you um, to the Arts Club for hosting this reading. Um, the, this is my first time reading an essay. I'm a poet by trade, so um, thank you for your patience in advance. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of context. My essay begins with a story about going to see Stevie Wonder with my father and Maddie, the partner that um, he dated several years after he and my mother split up. Um, Maddie died during my freshman year of college, and that's where, the, uh, that's where the excerpt that I'll be reading picks up. Maddie died of breast cancer during my freshman year, and as my father sought therapy through his artwork and eventually began dating another black woman, Margaret, I watched as sculptures and paintings featuring black women filled his walls. When he literally put Maddie on a pedestal by sculpting a clay bust of her, he attended carefully to accurately capturing the details of her beautiful face. Six years after Maddie's death, I met my wife, Terry, while pursuing a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry. When I brought her home, my father quietly noted to himself and later agreed when I shared with him my realization that Terry bore a resemblance to Maddie. As we got to know each other, Terry spoke often of having of having been too dark, in quotes, to be considered beautiful by her, by her high school classmates. And to this day, she deflects, though less than she did early in our relationship, compliments I give her about her appearance. But to me, her beauty was never a question. Her eyes, large, brown, and deeply contemplative, made me think to myself, as I covertly stared at her the first time we met, she's not just pretty, she thinks about the world. Shortly after Terry and I married, and nine years after Maddie's death, cancer would claim my father. As the only brother with a living space big enough to hold it all, I inherited much of my father's artwork. Having only known him for 27 years, I treasured his art's presence in our apartment. 
but the importance my, of my father's artwork, and especially the importance of the black women that, inhabited, that inhabit much of it, grew when Terry and I began raising our daughter. I have taught English in independent schools for 20 years, and in that time I have encountered a number of young women of color whose standards of beauty were informed by the dominant narrative about beauty that exists in our society and in the predominantly white institutions where I have worked. I have listened as black girls talk about compliments that follow the straightening of their hair, watched as they pined for elaborately conceived invitations to dances and prom, big asks, that white girls experience far more often. I have watched them look at black boys, especially athletes, as those boys' presence has been exoticized by fawning young white girls. So even before we decided to send our girl to one of those schools because we sensed in her a powerful intellect that would flourish the more she was challenged academically, Terry and I decided early on that we would model in the artwork our daughter would see, the books we would read to her and give her to read, and the music we would play for her, appreciation for the beauty of blackness. She would not wait, as Terry had, until her 30s to see a black woman depicted in art in a museum. The beauty of her blackness would, we told ourselves, never be a question. It would be as much a part of her life as Stevie Wonder was and is of mine. Terry's essay, um, and she was absolutely sick when, when she realized that she was not going to be able to be here because she's actually um, hosting a book club uh, for the Folger um, that ends at eight o'clock. So she might be able to slip in for the Q&A, but in her stead, I'm going to um, read a part of her essay that begins um, with, her, with her recollection of her internalized belief that dark skin was not beautiful and, and portrays her gradual recovery, a recovery that came through literature, the, the published books that she read and the original poems that she wrote and her parents' unfailing support and belief in her beauty. She, she intersperses her own poems in the essay and you'll hear a few of them as I read this excerpt. A few years later, when I met the man who would later become husband and the father of my children, I felt secure in myself and my appearance. But as our relationship quickly became serious, I wondered about how our potential children would look. He was biracial, German and black. I was plain and simple black. But really, when is black ever plain and simple? A recent ancestry DNA showed Bantu, sorry, a recent ancestry DNA test showed Bantu, Nigerian, and surprisingly, Russian and Finnish in my maternal grandmother's ancestry. In my father's, Bantu and the countries of Benin and Ghana were heavily represented, as were Ireland, Scotland, France, England, and some trace amount of Native American ancestry. Again, black is never simple in America. Here's a poem, mixed. I marvel over my husband's hair. The lapping curl is his black father's. The fineness is his white mom's. His hair tells a story if it can't be read from his skin. But what was simple and has always been simple was the dearth of images showing dark skin as stereotypically beautiful. We know symmetry pleases the eye in nature, in flowers, and in ourselves. Those among us with evenly spaced eyes, a centered nose, a mouth not too high up or too far down are seen as attractive. Black culture is no different. The black women who receive the most attention in communities and in the media for their beauty also tend to have what is perceived as European physiology. Slim noses, thin or appropriately full lips, sometimes blue, green or gray eyes, and or straight or thin curly hair. Prime examples include former Miss America Vanessa Williams, actress Dorothy Dandridge, actress singer Lena Horne, and contemporaries like Holly Berry, Sanaya Lathan, Zendaya, Yara Shahidi, the list goes on. All of these women are either light-skinned or mixed race. They are the ones held up as proof that black women can be pretty, even beautiful. Occasionally a darker-skinned black woman gets this, gets this pedestal, Viola Davis or Lupita Nyong'o. But more often than not, it is the light-skinned black women who are touted as beautiful and, therefore, the standard. I knew 
going into a relationship with a biracial man, the odds were that any child of ours would be lighter than my deep brown complexion, and their hair would be what the kids at my high school called good hair. Yet I wanted, thankfully we wanted, to raise our children who loved all shades of black and saw, sorry, to raise children who loved all shades of black and saw beauty in themselves, just like their mother, like their father. Because my late father-in-law was an artist who painted black women, the walls in our home are adorned with images of black women in art. The bookshelves in our children's rooms and all around our home are lined with books affirming beauty in all shades of blackness. I compliment my daughter and my son often and sincerely because I know they need a foundation of affirmation that will withstand the buffeting winds of colorism and racism outside our home. If someone were to tell them they have good hair, I need them to push back. No matter and in spite of what they may hear, learn, or be told, I need them to know all shades of blackness are beautiful. And it ends with the poem, You Tenderheaded? I am teaching my husband how the first tooth of a comb defines the line, how to grease the exposed scalp, how to massage through the kink in each curl. I am relearning how to cornrow, knuckles kneading the tender, separating the rough. Like I did, he has to learn to love the plat, to love the part. Thank you. Thank you, Hayes, and I really wish, I know we all wish Terry could have been here. Um, so you could see who she is. Some of you know, some of you don't. And um, thank you all, you read, all, everyone for preparing and all of you who read terrific parts of your essays, of your terrific essays. And we at Katie and I are so, so grateful that you sent us essays to contribute to this book. The writer's essays made the book. We, we were just stunned when we get them. And I have to say that we were told the copy editor cried through seven of the essays, the copy editor, while she was reading. And when I read them for the final time, I could had to read through the whole book again. I read the essays many times in different versions. I could not take more than about five at a time before I was full. I just, I just had to stop there. So, so moving and so deep and rich. And now, I'm going to turn this back over to Martin for some Q&A. Thank you very much, Rosemary. And I'd like to uh, reiterate uh, your praise for these fabulous readers we had tonight. Um, just a note with Terry Cross Davis, even though we didn't get to see her tonight, you can tune into our YouTube channel. And she was interviewed not too long ago by uh, Dorit Carroll, a fellow poet, uh, reading some of uh, Terry Cross Davis, read some of her poems. So please uh, take advantage of that opportunity on our Facebook page, Arts Club of Washington. And I also wanted to note um, Rosemary, the background of Rosemary, of course, is a beautiful painting by her husband, John. And John is actually with us because it's a self-portrait, isn't there, in the background there? So you're... <laughs> in a chair over there, too, but he doesn't want to say hi. Okay. Yeah, John painting the painting. Well, John is with us anyway. Whether he wants to be or not, he's there in, uh, in, the, in, your, in your beautiful painting. And also a reminder that uh, the, the book cover is done by John Winslow. And that um, painting is a scene in Sandwich Notch here in New Hampshire called Be Falls, and this is a scene of water on our property up here in New Hampshire. Uh, Although the magic people are not there and Pan is not in it, so. Great. Well, why don't we try to give ourselves maybe five or 10 minutes for a Q and A. And what I'd like to uh, ask you to do, unless Sasha has a different idea, would be to basically at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to toggle and see something called chat. And a lot of people have been chatting uh, and telling us how wonderful uh, the the readings have been, but if you have a particular question you want to ask a particular reader, or if you have a general question, uh, please just submit it and we'll see if we can take uh, maybe two or three questions and, and finish up about 8.05 or 8.10. But I have the pleasure of asking a first question uh, because one of the things that really struck me about the readings that there seems to be a theme that adversity 
and hardship deepen our sense of beauty. So that kind of begs the question for me, how does this pandemic, how has it affected your sense of beauty? And I'm wondering if any of the readers would like to take a, take a shot at answering that question. How has the pandemic affected your uh, experience of beauty? Any volunteers? Hayes, would you like yeah. to? Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I have always loved nature. My father, who I mentioned in the essay, took me to um, a part of Philadelphia called Valley Green, which is similar to uh, Rock Creek Park or Sligo Creek Park if you live in the, um, in the D.C. area. And we live not far from Sligo and, and not far from the Anacostia watershed uh, Northwest Branch Trail. So because of the pandemic and because nature was a kind of safer place to be, um, my uh, son and I, and well, I mean, uh, the, the whole family really has spent a lot of time um, in those places and getting away from the cars and even though there's been a whole lot less traffic, getting away from the cars and getting away from the news and getting, you know, getting off of a screen. I'm a teacher, so I've been staring at a screen for six or seven hours a day since school started. Nature means so much more to me now. The beauty of nature is that much more fulfilling, is that much more um, settling, is that much more enriching. So that's uh, natural beauty has been something that's helped me to kind of weather this storm. Forgive the cliche. Um, Mar oh, Great. sorry. Yeah. Wanna... Hey, Katie, did you want to? Um, I, I just to go back to that question of hardship. Um, I, I think for me, the pandemic has really crystallized what is most important in life, or at least in my life. You know, we're not able to get out and go to dinner parties or the things that we may like to do. And um, I think it's really simplified for me what's most important in life and what is most beautiful. And like many people of my generation, I have children, I have grandchildren. I've spent a fair amount of time babysitting for my grandchildren uh, over the course of the last six months. And I have learned the beauty, relearned the beauty of hanging out with the two-year-old. Um, so it's, it's really, I think, coming to appreciate what might be considered those small moments in life, but they become so much more important because perhaps we are denied many of the other things that we enjoy doing. Deborah, were you? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going, there's a wonderful quote at the beginning of the book from Helen Keller. It says, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. And that's what, I mean, protests do come out of adversity, but that's kind of the wonderful thing, I think, that I, I realized much long after I wrote the essay, I realized that what was so beautiful about protests was we were there out of adversity, and most of the people that you would meet from anywhere in the world, um, perfect strangers, would tell you their stories. And those stories came out of such adversity that you realized, it, you know, there was so much more in the world that was going on than what was going on in your own life. And I think the pandemic, of course, has exacerbated everything, right? It's exacerbated all of the, all of the troubles, and um, when I was at the uh, candlelight vigil for and Ruth Peter Ginsburg the other night, I, and we were all with our masks and we were all trying to, you know, put space between us at the same time. And there were thousands of us in front of the Supreme Court at night. And we were doing our best through the adversity. And a young woman and her boyfriend were next to me and they kept looking at me and my friend. And she was very much a couple generations younger than me. And she said, she looked at me and you can't see people's mouths, so it's harder to communicate. And she said, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate having you here. And I'm thinking that was, and that was, that was so lovely. And she said, isn't this wonderful? And I said, yes, it is. It's, it's so wonderful. And I think that's, it's those connections that you make. It's, very, it's an emotional connection that you make at protests, which is now even more layered and more complex because of the political situation and the pandemic right now. So it's, um, it, it's ever more precious. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, does anyone else have a question? Um, you could you could unmute yourself as well. I don't see anything in the in the Zoom chat, but if you have a question, why don't you unmute? Uh, maybe we have time for uh, for one or two more questions before we wrap up. I see anybody unmuting. Martin, I did want to just say hello to Terry, who I see has joined Hayes. Hi, Terry. We're so glad you made it. Oh, there she is. Hi, Terry. Hi. <laughs> Terry, I told everyone they could uh, see you on our, our uh, Facebook channel. Yeah. where you're being interviewed by Dorit Carroll, who I believe is with us tonight as well, uh, observing. So thank you for doing that for us, and thank you for the beautiful reading. Hayes did a pretty good job. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, she did an excellent job. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, I w I've been thinking a lot about during the pandemic, I happen to live in a ground floor apartment, and I have a beautiful big uh, window I can look out on. And I'm just struck being a person of a certain age that's more vulnerable to the virus than, than young people, all the young adults walking by with masks on. And every time I see that, I just feel so grateful. You know, these are people who they are at risk, but not nearly as much risk as somebody my age, but they're taking that precaution. They're really almost putting their lives on hold in order to protect me. And it just gives me such a sense of gratitude and, and the real beauty that exists in the world uh, that to me, that's what the pandemic has come to mean. Well, are there any uh, final concluding words, Katie and uh, Rosemary, you'd like to, to make before we let people get back to their, uh, their suppers and other things? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Martin, the Arts Club, and everyone for reading who read it, and all of you for coming to be the audience. There's no reading without an audience. So you were half of it. Thank you so much. I would echo the same. And um, for me, the book has been a journey, um, a journey with Rosemary, but also with the writers. And I, I am so grateful. I haven't had the opportunity to meet a lot of you because of the pandemic, but I feel I know your work a little bit better. I hope we'll have the chance to meet and uh, continue on this journey together. And right. thank you to the Arts Club and Martin and Sasha. Big thank you to Sasha. Yeah, you are three, so three cheers for Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I enjoyed reading the your readings were so beautiful. I didn't want to interrupt the flow. But it was it was a really beautiful, beautiful night. I feel so much more grounded right now for that for these readings. So thank you for sharing your your words. And just a reminder before we close that you can of course purchase the book, and it's available at Woodhall Press. There's a website that you can get to. Uh, you can get it through our um, Arts Club website, where the event listing has a link to it, but uh, basically you just do a, a search for Deep Beauty, Woodhall Press, of course our wonderful editors, Rosemary Winslow and Catherine Lee, and you'll find it uh, pretty quickly. Thank and you I, all. Sorry, like, Rosemary. Also a website uh, that Katie and her uh, relatives put up, basically, of, of the uh, all the writers, all the pictures are there. The writers all put pictures that go with their essays. There's more description. So you might also check out thebeautybook.com. Right. Thedeepbeautybook.com. The Deep Beauty Book. I didn't say it right. <laughs> you were close. <laughs> Deep Beauty. Deep, Deepbeautybook.com. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, on that note of deep beauty, I'm going to bid you all a good night and thank you again to all the wonderful readers. Should we just sort of wave to uh, to them and, and thanking them? Hey, I'm recording this, so give me like a nice good wave. <laughs> 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 oh, you're all so beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you again, Sasha, Rosemary, and Katie. Good night. Thank good night, you. everybody. Good night.